Hello, welcome to Speech Talk Live. This is episode number 42. My name is Jay Oza. I'm the host of the show, and I have my co-host, uh, as usual, Julie Wu Finkelstein. And uh, we do this show uh, weekly. We are loosely affiliated with uh, the Coursera's uh, uh, public speaking course called Introduction to Public Speaking. And we take these recordings and post it on their discussion forum as a way to uh, help students who are trying to learn this uh, difficult skill. So uh, what we try to do on this show is uh, address uh, certain topics, uh, speech-related topics, and Julie and I are both mentors and we discuss it. It's just the best way to reach the wider audience since our audience is pretty global. Uh, there are students taking courses from all over the world, <clears throat> since this is on Coursera. And uh, the reason we do this is uh, for a number of reasons. One is that uh, we really take this skill seriously, and we want to learn, we want to get better, and there's no way to get better than to actually teach it. So whatever we're learning, we like to teach others, and at the same time, we also want to get better at this too, so we, it, it gives us an opportunity to practice, uh, and at the same time, we want to help others because there are a lot of people out there who really don't think about improving this skill, primarily because they are fairly functional in a sense that you know they, they're pretty functional when it comes to social interaction, and even at work, if they're very good uh, with some technical skill, they probably don't need to uh, interact uh, verbally that much. But that's all changing, folks. So this is a skill that uh, we all need to get better at it as uh, more and more I find out that this is the becoming the most important skill uh, in just about anything. You know, you can get to the certain point, but you're not going to get to the top unless you have this skill. Well, anyway, enough of I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, today's show, uh, we usually have a three-minute segment where Julie and I will basically freestyle, pick any topic, and talk for three minutes. It's a very good way for us to practice. And then we will move into our scheduled segments. Uh, and the first segment, uh, I'm going to do, it's a discussion topic. I've recorded a video. And I've recorded a video where I analyzed this famous speech that was given by Amy Curry, who's a professor at Harvard. And she gave this uh, TED talk. It's it's a TED talk in 2012, and I analyze it because I think it's a really a wonderful speech uh, to analyze why it's working because it's one of the most popular TED talk for the last two years. It has the most number of views for the past two years, and this is from 60 Minutes, so I'm pretty sure they're pretty reliable. In the second segment, we're going to do something different. This is where how do you take uh, something where you want to demonstrate? So uh, uh, Julie has uh, recorded a show and tell video of a book uh, of a, one of the poses for the book she's writing, uh, 12 Poses to Energize Yourself. I'm not sure if that's the title. We'll ask her what the tentative title of the book is. And I'll let Julie discuss that and talk about it. And th this is another way of practicing. You know, Julie's writing a book. And this is her way of showing you how to do it. So I think uh, I'll let Julie talk about it. And you know, as you can see, she's get, get, getting much better. This is her fifth pose uh, that she has recorded, I believe. And then in the third segment, we will talk about, it's a discussion topic, about something that I include in my book called the message hack. And a message hack is very important because anytime you are going out and talking to somebody, you need to make sure you got your message down cold, because people out there are not going to pay attention if you don't have it. And we will uh, describe it. I have a video that kind of describes this. I'm not going to go into detail. And then uh, Julie and I are both going to show you our message hack for the book that we're writing. So it gives you an idea how we have developed it. Now, we can't go show you the incremental stages, but this is sort of our third or fourth take, so it's going to be a little bit more polished, but it wasn't that way when we first started it, but you'll get an idea. So that's the show for today, and as usual, if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, you know, please let us know, because we want to make sure that this is helping you, and uh, hopefully it's also motiv motivating you to, to record videos and become uh, you know good at the skills. So any kind of 
comments or anything you have, let, let us know, okay? So at this point, I'll uh, turn it over to Julie so she can introduce herself, and then we'll move on to our three-minute uh, speech segment. Julie, take it over. Thanks, Jay. Yes, um, doing these uh, every Friday speeches, and we're on episode 42, is just so... Um, Amazing for me. I just want to thank you for that. I am much more comfortable, as you will see, as you mentioned, because I've done it so many times. <clears throat> I can for sure in hundreds of times. I think today I would say that um, I'm very interested in this whole idea of message hack, and uh, I am interested in communicating what you, what makes us successful using body and mind practices and that's what I spoke is and I'm writing an article on identity and I'm going to try to how to work that through and that will be in today's uh, three minute speech thank you <clears throat> yeah uh, Julie thanks a lot so one one more thing uh, this message act is something we have done before, but I think it's so important that it doesn't hurt to do it again. This time we're using this message hack. I think last time we may just have discussed it. This time we're going to give you real examples, uh, each of our personal examples related to the message that we want to convey regarding the book that we're writing. And that's what we're using as an example. So I think this is going to become be more useful for people out there who are watching it. And I'm going to actually, I may put both of these segments, uh, the first and definitely the third one, on the Coursera platform because I think there's something there to teach. And then the entire show, I always put it on. But I may separate these two segments out. If I'll ask Julie at the end if it's worth, depending on how it goes. <laughs> I don't want to send put something that's not that good, something that's going to be helpful. So at this point, I'm going to take a brief pause and uh, introduce, uh, get started with our next uh, segment, which is our three-minute speech segment, OK? OK, welcome back. Uh, my name is Jay Oza, and I have my co-host, uh, Julie Wu Finkelstein. And uh, this is uh, the three-minute uh, speech segment part of the show. And this is sort of our way of practicing and also a way of also teaching others that these are the kind of things you have to do if you want to improve your public speaking skills. Now, I don't know how good we are, but like uh, Julie mentioned, this is our 42nd episode. So, you know, we're getting more and more comfortable, probably. I don't know if you notice it or not, but we are getting. In the beginning, I. The reason I'm saying is because we have a lot of people who have joined us and they just have not been able to sustain it for whatever reason. Some of because you know they're working and all that, but we haven't seen any videos or anything. So I want to encourage people that this is something you've got to keep doing. Nowadays it's not that difficult. You got these uh, these you know these cameras, you just put a play and start recording. It's not that difficult. There are no more excuses left, folks, not to be good at this skill. I I don't want to hear people saying, Oh, it's scary and this and no, it's not that scary, okay? You just have to learn how to press a button. That's all it is. So uh, uh, I'm going to be hard on you. <laughs> so at this point, uh, I'm going to move on to my three-minute uh, speech segment. And <clears throat> this one is uh, something that I started doing. And I haven't been that forthcoming. Um, many of you see these uh, speeches that I record for these uh, uh, discussion topics uh, for Speech Talk Live. Uh, but in my book, when I talk about the speech hack, I was looking at it. I, I give a more like how to get started. But then I think I should also be honest and tell you how I actually do it. Because I think I've advanced past what I recommend in, that, uh, in my book. So here's what I do. And I call it, uh, I've tentatively titled this uh, subchapter, One Shot to Kill. So what do, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that I want to try to simulate what it would be like giving a speech in front of an audience. Because when you're giving a speech in front of an audience, you only have one shot. You can't go back and saying, oh, by the way, I screwed up. Let me give the speech all over again. It doesn't work like that. You're only going to get one shot to do it right. So the question is, how do you practice that? So what I started doing is, um, and I have a lucky because I have a, a whiteboard right, you know, left of me here, 
and I can write down uh, what I want to talk about. Sometimes I don't even use it. And what, what this means is that, in a nutshell, I'll simplify it because I don't want to make this too complicated. If you go through brainstorming, uh, you know, coming up with all kinds of ideas, and then you come up with an outline, what I do is I tend to practice uh, uh, on my audio recorder. So on my audio recorder, I will, I'll just take it out, I'll show you. So this is what I use to practice my speech. Okay, so that's what I do. So anything that I'm not happy with, I will just uh, use this and listen to it. And when I turn on the camera, I want to do it on the first take. That's what I mean by one shot to kill. So the camera is sort of acting as the audience, that I'm just going to now get in front of the camera like I am speaking in front of an audience. So that puts a little pressure on me because I have to do it right. What, what I recommended in that speech hack is like, oh, you can go back and you know redo it, do multiple takes. I do that because there are a lot of people out there <laughs> who have fear and they're not, uh, they've not done it as many as uh, you know Julie and I have. So what I want to try and encourage you is that if you start doing that and you want to move on to the step, the fa uh, step that I'm in right now, the phase that I'm in is that I do go through all the first few steps, like you know coming up with the ideas and then coming creating an outline. And once I have an outline, I'll just speak right from the outline. And what I do is I practice it on the audio recorder. Now here I can record it several times, but once I got it, in, once I get in front of the camera, I really want to do it in the first take. I rarely do multiple takes. So I try to avoid that because that's the type of pressure I want. And if I can do that, then I know that if I'm in front of an audience, I'll be able to handle it. So I just wanted to kind of tell you about the speech hack that I've kind of advanced past what I'm recommending in the book. And I also included this part in the book too, that uh, this is what I have kind of uh, advanced towards now where I could do it in one take, but it's not that simple. I do have to practice quite a bit uh, to get to that point, okay? So that's uh, something you may want to try if you have started uh, using the speech hack. All right, Julie, you can take over. What a great idea. Thanks, Jay. Um, the way I do it is I give myself three hacks, and I find that that um, gives me enough pressure and it gives me enough time to organize it. So that uh, <clears throat> for me, the the content is not the issue. It's more the um, performance. So the three hacks helps me to get more comfortable with my performance. So today, um, I'm going to jump right in with the topic of creating an identity. Um, Amy Cuddy's talk was really wonderful. What she talks about is our body language affects how others see us, but then it also affects how we see ourselves. Um, and I want to add this one more point that as a self, it's a combination of body and mind, right? And they're really not separate, right? We, they're like, like this. You can't tell one from the other. They're intimately re together. But one of the areas, and, and not only are they together, as a body and mind, we're capable of learning and evolving based on the feedback loop. We get stuck when the feedback loop gets stuck. Okay, but one of the basis we can create a nice fluid fee feedback loop for us is working on our sense of identity to answer the question who we are. And I think that this question who we are can become a core value. You know, these days we talk about core, and it, it becomes the center of our being, and we can come out to the world in this way. I've come up with seven basic questions. I think that will help us to come to our identity, and certainly the Myers-Briggs test addresses that. So the, the question number one is, what is my interest? What do I love? What am I passionate about? What do I care about? The second question is, what's my style? And that, I think, is where Myers-Briggs comes in. Am I an introvert or am I extrovert? Do I inspire or do I control? Um, do I analyze or do I intuit? And I know there's one more. And then the third one is what are the talents and the skills and the experience I have in the back 
in my pocket, right, that I can work with. And finally, I don't think this is ever addressed, but how do I want to posi position myself in society? How much money do I have? How much prestige do I have? Do I want? How much money do I want? And um, how do I want to relate to my family? You know, those are relationship questions. And people don't talk about money, but money is always like the elephant in the room. So put it on the table. Okay, finally, the question is more existential, is how do I want, what is my place in the universe, right? We already opened up the relationship question because we talk about my, our relationships with our family. We can expand that with our relationship with our colleagues, our relationship with our co uh, community, and finally, our relationship in our existential being. Even as an atheist, we have a place in the universe of things. And all those questions, when you can do a brain map, I love doing drawings, is you can go back and circle the things that's really important to you. And that becomes your core dump, <laughs> literally, right? And that's a question of who I am. And out of that, I think we can do a message hack. Or, you know, I like Ronald Reagan's idea of anything that's important to you, you can put it in a page, right? Out of that, who I am, because of Amy Cuddy's speech and my own commitment and decades of work in the body-mind area, I think it would be very nice to role play, dress rehearsal, visualize, talk to a practice buddy, find a practice buddy. And this can be useful in four areas, I think. One is just how you position and relate to other people in the world. You know, if you are a caring person, how do you handle a conflicting situation? How do you, if you are an inspiration person, what are your levels of inspiration skills? It also helps you in doing your introductions, whether you're in a family, situ in a social situation, in a networking, or in a staff meeting, or in the elevator, and your boss's boss is there. How do you make that time count, right? And fin finally, those things can help you develop visions and projects that are meaningful to you and is in alignment with your core values. So this idea of identity development, I think it's a very powerful idea, and I just want to present that. So thank you very much. Yeah, I think there's a book here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think what you said is, uh, uh, is very important. It looks like you've been giving a lot of thought to this uh, particular topic. But one thing I'm going to mention is... Uh, yeah, you mentioned this is about... my mind map. I just wanted to share. Oh, that. right. Excellent. Yeah, so that's something you may want to, like, uh, as a, once you've finished your first book, that's something you may want to, like, create more information and see if there is a book there. I think there is. But uh, Thank you. The one thing I'll tell you is what you mentioned about money. And I think one of the questions that uh, people do not ask, uh, I see people that are constantly just chasing money. And the question they do not ask, and I didn't ask this either, but then it, it just happened accidentally, is like, you know, I have a 401k and all of that. That's, I don't even pay attention to it, right? So that money is there, okay? Uh, like the, the bank balance and all. And then, you know, I paid off my house and all that. So, and I don't have any, you know, brand new car. So I, I don't believe in taking on debt. Okay, I paid off my daughter's college education and all that. Uh, and, and then I asked myself, so this took a while, and I asked myself, uh, how much money, minimum amount of money do you need to be happy? Now, I, I don't want you know people to say like, oh, I need this, I need to travel on vacation and all that. Those are, not, uh, th those are not really necessary in my opinion. I'm just asking that like if you suddenly had to make a choice, like how much do you really, really need minimum? to be still be happy you know can you put a food on the table and all this and i think a lot of times people just don't know what that number is or they don't have an idea like in my case i realized that once i paid off my house and i don't have any brand new car and my daughter had, had graduated that i really don't need a lot of money and then just trying to chase that money there are so many other things that you're going to have to pay that, that that you're going to have to compromise on 
and you're not going to be happy. Like if I had to suddenly go and start chasing money and take on a typical the sales job I had, I would be traveling and then I wouldn't be spending time. My health probably wouldn't be good. So there are a lot of trade offs there. And I think it all starts with, like you said, you, you've got to know because you've got to, you know, like I said, we all have to pay our bills and stuff. But I think people uh, overestimate that. They think they need a lot more than they really do. And because of that, the they just keep on chasing something. They want more and more and more. And they're not asking that fundamental question. What is at the end? What is what, is, what are they going to? And then it's too late. <laughs> so I th they got me thinking when you mentioned that. I think we have... Um... I think we should do another dialogue session on money, life, and what's important. All right, yeah. So let's yeah. do that because this could uh, because there are a lot of things you raised in that that identity. That's what I was saying that there's a book there because each of those things you have to really ask yourself. And even the one about the practice buddy, I think, is so important. Just from what I I like the value I get from just uh, just talking to you, and. It's. I think people need to figure out. They need to get a buddy, whether it's anything you're starting. Uh, anyway, I, I'm digressing. There was this one uh, talk uh, I just watched. I'll, I'll send you the link for it. It's uh, a professor at Northwestern. His name is Brian Uzi, and he's done a TED talk where he talks about how collaborate, how working in teams has changed so much from the old days. That ninety percent of the research, the, the the people who write papers are in teams, compared to ten percent that are done by individual. And it's very interesting. I'll send you the link for it. I don't want to take up too much time since we have a pretty full uh, schedule today. All right, so let me take a brief pause, and if you can mute your line, I'll start the next uh, segment. Okay, welcome back. Uh, to Speech Talk Live, uh, episode number 42. My name is Jay Oza, and uh, my co-host uh, is Julie Wu Finkelstein. And this uh, segment number one, we're going to take a look at the famous speech uh, that Amy Cuddy gave at the TED Talk that pretty much uh, made her famous, essentially. I mean, nobody had ever, I never heard of her before that. And... Uh, uh, it's a speech she gave uh, in 2012, and I recorded a video where I, I really like this speech for many reasons, because I think one of the things that I'm going to do after I finish my book that I'm currently working on, this book is more about how to get started and get to a certain point. Uh, the next book that I'm thinking of writing is looking at certain speech models. So that whenever you have to give a speech, you just take a look at a model to follow and then just put your content in that type of a model and give it, right? I don't know if there are any books out there that does that. So I'm going to come across like different models for an introductory speech, an impromptu speech, an informative speech, and a persuasive speech, and look at several models to, to look at. Like if you have to give a speech, rather than trying to figure it out, just look at this model and see if you can Put fit yours into that model, so that way you don't have to do a lot of work. And this would be one of them, Amy Curry's speech. Uh, uh, and what I like about it is, I, it, like I said, on 60 Minutes, they mentioned that this is the most popular TED Talk for the, la the last two years. It's been the most uh, viewed. So I went back and I said, let me listen to this and see what is it that makes this uh, TED Talk work? What makes it so great? And I came across seven things that she does in this, okay? Now, I didn't want to go beyond that. I'm sure there are more there, but I think seven is pretty sufficient here. And I said, if I had to ever give a speech, I could use this model and what she does. Uh, and the, the one thing I was just like talking to my dad, and I said, if I asked you that I, have a, that I want you to listen to this uh, talk from this professor who's going to talk about her research, would you be interested in listening to it? And he said, oh, probably not, because I don't want to really, you know, I don't want to know about somebody's research. It'll probably be very dry. And then I think of it that that's essentially what Amy Cuddy really does. She's really talking about her research. But what she does, how she does it, is what makes the speech great. And this is something, so when people say, well, oh, my topic is boring, it's not your topic. It's just the way you're giving your speech is boring. Because Amy Cuddy clearly shows that in a sense, this is a research topic. This is a professor talking about her research, and she makes it so, you know, so much uh, captivating 
to listen to it. So the seven things she does, I'll just go through it quickly, and then I'll let uh, Julie comment on it and what she what she thinks. Uh, the first thing, if you notice, when she starts out her speech, she makes a promise, and the promise is very important. She tells the people that there is this no tech life hack, no tech life hack. She's going to uh, show them, and as long as they just wait at the end, they know it's coming. And then she does. Uh, she injects humor right away in, into the speech. And I think that's very important. So she puts out the promise, then she goes right into light humor. And that humor is important in the beginning because it makes her likable. It like it makes the audience kind of ease up a little bit, saying, okay, this is not some stiff I'm listening to. This is somebody I can relate to. You know, she's uh, humor works, okay? And I always think that you should use some kind of humor. Uh, and it's People are always not sure, but practice that. This is one thing you do have to practice because that it, that beginning on how the audience feels about you is extremely important. If you get them in the beginning, you'll probably keep them till the end. Okay, and she does that really well here. Uh, she comes across as a very likable person, something that you're going to give her a shot. It's almost like telling your brain, "I like her, so I'm going to listen to her more." That's what she did. And then she goes into what I call the meat of her speech, which is the information part, which takes her about close to 15 minutes, 15 to 16 minutes, where she goes into her research on how your nonverbals can influence you, how your body can influence your mind. And she talks about all kinds of uh, you know, scientific stuff there about hormones, testosterone, and uh, cortisol. And she does it in a very uh, uh, nice way that you kind of really get into the, the research with all sorts of uh, slides that she's showing, the poses and all that. So she actually has that piece organized really well. Now, she could have ended that speech right after that and saying, okay, here's my conclusion. Boom, the speech is over. And it would have been a good informative speech, okay, if she had ended it right there. So she had a chance to end it right there. A lot of people end it right there. It would have been a good informative speech. But she doesn't end it there. Then, after that 16-minute mark, she goes into her personal story. And suddenly, everybody's now like, oh, oh, she's now going there. She's telling about her personal story. So there is some why here. Like, why is this particular topic so important to her? So she essentially ties the research to her own personal story. Excellent. You got it. If you can do that, then you are really moving into the next stage of your public speaking. She does that so effectively, and she talks about that for close to three and a half minutes, and at the end of that, she ties into the signature moment, which I call it the signature moment of her speech, which is you fake it till you become it. And she gets emotional. She talks about that even though she has made it, but now she's in a position to advise this other woman in her MBA class that, hey, I was in your situation. You've got to fake it till you become it. And that is really the, the tagline, the signature moment, and the tagline of the speech, OK? Now, she could have ended it right there, OK? So that would have been a very persuasive speech at that point. She's moved from informative to persuasive at this point once she ties in her personal story on why she's interested in this research. OK, but she doesn't stop there. She continues, OK? And at that point, she now, remember, she had made a promise in the beginning. So now she has to reward the audience. And she rewards them with the power pose that she shows and the benefits because she's already told them that she's done research and how it affects your testosterone and cortisol. Yet she doesn't end it there either. Then she has that one last thing that she does, and that's, I call it the ask. And here's where she's saying that, listen, this is something you have now the opportunity to take what you've learned and help others who do not have that same type of an opportunity who are in that evaluative situation, whether they're going for a job interview or in school or whatever, with giving a speech like she's giving, that this is something that will allow them to succeed. The simple thing here, it doesn't take much, it doesn't cost anything, but just you know it pass it on to others, spread it so they can be helped. And that's her ask. That's what she really wants people to do. This has helped me. Now I want you to take this and help others. So I think if you look at it in an entirety, this is a masterful structure. The entire speech is a masterful structure, and it works. And it's a model that anybody can use if you're given a situation where you 
have something that you think is informative that people can directly use? Like we do this on the show, like a, we're going to show it whether we can pull this off with our message hack. Uh, that would be sort of our example of how we can channel this Amy Curdy's approach into uh, getting you to do the message hack and pass it on to others. So we'll see if that, work, that works or not. But, but this is a very effective speech. And the way she does it, I think, is uh, something that we should all try to copy because it works. Julie, what do you think? Thanks, Jay. Yeah, I really appreciate your analysis. And um, I think each of those points probably merits study and practice. Um, the thing that, um, uh, that really hit me was when you talk about a signature moment. Her, you identify her signature moment as fake it till you become it. And I thought that um, the signature moment, uh, I, I thought I would combine that idea with two things. One is the message hack, and two is the sandwich technique, which are the two ideas we've been working with. The signature moment should be the tagline in our message hack. So for example, you had the your your tagline your tagline, I hope I'm not giving away too much here, is you are how you speak or something like that. Let's just pretend that it is. So um and my my uh, tagline wasn't so clear, but let's say the body mind together can learn and evolve. Okay. So that's my tagline. So we can use that tagline um, in the sandwich technique to pivot, to be the signifier, to go from one section to another. So for example, I can start the speech with, the, the, the body mind together can learn and evolve. Your, we all have problems in our life and we all have goals and we all want to fit into this world. The, the body, once given the opportunity to evolve, can, um, these stretches will help the body and mind to evolve. It is a fundamental tool. And then, um, and I, I'll say important because we all want to move ahead in our lives, blah, 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 blah. At some point, I want to move into um, the, the details of how these do it. And so I can say, let me tell you the let's say I'm trying to do the fun, the base let me tell you the basic laws that makes this possible that makes this body mind can evolve one is our body is naturally aligned with gravity and so when we are with gravity our body is efficient and functional to um, awareness attention and intention changes things when you do these stretches, you do it with awareness, you know, and so on. So let's say that whatever number of points I want, I can say those are the reasons why when you do those poses, it helps our body and mind to evolve, to learn, to problem solve, and to master tools and to feel serene. And then, um, and then I'll say, when you do these speeches, you can blah, 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 basically summarize my points. And at the end, I said, I could say something like, well, I've given you the, the why it's important in your life to have the body and mind to evolve. I've given you the principles. Please do these stretches. So I just thought that it was a very elegant way of putting all the stuff we have together. And I wanted to share that synthesis with you. Yeah, right. No, I, I agree. But o overall, I, I like what she does in the beginning. So I think one of the things that uh, uh, I think you definitely, I think we can all can do. If, I think if you're ever teaching somebody, you, and this is a format that I think um, may work very well with what you're trying to do, is that you, you start out by making a promise that I'm going to, and I'm not sure whether you do this, I have to see, I don't remember now the triangle pose that, hey, I'm going to show you this simple pose that's going to make this much of a difference. But then you don't show it right away. Then you go into and inform them. Now, before I show you, let me just explain to you what this thing is really going to do. And then you can talk about how it's helped you. For, oh, you could talk about like what this pose really is. 
and some of the if there's any research to back it up then include that then you can basically then talk about personally how this pose is helping you and then you can show them that that's the reward now you've got them involved engaged now you can reward them by showing the pose and then the ask could be so now you have learned it you know go take it and show it to your loved ones or your friends or anybody out there who could benefit from it so there is a real formula here that could work really well with what what you're trying to do with these um, these energy uh, uh, 12 energy poses w what do you think you're muted yeah no definitely just um I agree. Uh, maybe we can talk about that offline, and maybe we have another dialogue on how we can. Uh, you can apply this formula to someone else, like to my speech or to your speech. So that's that's great. So I think you came up with a very nice formula, and now what you just said is giving me an example how it can apply. So maybe we can talk about that and expand that into. Um, um, another dialogue or another speech because uh, that's how people learn, right? They learn the idea, then they see how it's applied. So, right, right, right. Great yeah, idea. Yeah, that's why I wanted to kind of, uh, because I think this is one speech that uh, is a good model that uh, I think, like, if you ever have to show somebody, hey, I want to give, I want to show this, you can say, well, here's a particular model and why this model works so well. So that's why I wanted to kind of bring it up. All right. I think uh, we pretty much covered this, so uh, we're going to move on to our next segment. Next segment. So let me just take a brief pause, and then we'll I'll introduce you the next segment. Okay. All right. Welcome back to Speech Talk Live. This is episode forty-two. My name is Jay Oza. Uh, I'm the host of the show, and my co-host is Julie Wu Finkelstein. And in the second segment that we're going to do. Uh, Julie is going to uh, has recorded a video uh, based on the book that she's writing about twelve poses that energize that can energize oneself, uh, energize oneself. Uh, and in this one, she has recorded a video where she's showing this uh, pose uh, or stretch uh, on called triangle. So rather than me talk about it, I'll let uh, Julie introduce it and uh, then. She can just ask any kind of feedback or maybe just uh, what she's trying to accomplish with this uh, post. So, Julie, why don't you take it over and explain to us uh, what you recorded and uh, this particular pose. Thanks, Jay. I definitely will take any and all feedback from you, and I appreciate all the uh, support and feedback you, and the words of wisdom you've given me. Um, so this is uh, the fifth pose, which is almost near the m middle of it. And I, I'll talk about the pose and I'll talk about my speech technique. So the pose itself, the whole series has to be done in sequence because it's like um, the uh, peeling the layers of the onion. You have to do it methodically, one step at a time. And the method, methodics is it opens up the inside and then we open up the outside and then we go back and open up the inside some more in these stretches and then we balance everything and we reorganize so we're kind of like playing our body like an accordion like this okay so the our triangle is the most external of the moves it moves it opens up the skin and also up from the top to the bottom because you're you're stretched out and then you bend and also opens up um, the um, the all the way to the fingertips so the psoas and everything the whole spine is aligned um, he introduced the idea that the body is elastic in the sense that when you when you pull it open the body opens up and then the other concept is that the body is plastic so when we sit down and reorganize in the Shavasana, we hold on to this new possibility. So elastic helps us open and uh, continuously expand. Plastic means we hold a new shape. Um, so that's basically the triangle. It's a classical yoga pose. You can find it anywhere. Um, so 
In terms of the speech, then, in the introduction, I introduced the concept of what the triangle is doing, the inside and the outside, and I introduced the concept of the accordion. In the details, I demonstrated it. At, at that point, I closed my eyes. As a presenter, it, I should have kept my eyes open, but as a matter of fact, you can choose that. Um, and then I did the conclusion, which is where the awareness is in asking the audience to do a self-audit. My own uh, self-evaluation is this, is one, I could keep the eyes open during the speech, and two, I, tra I didn't have a transition between the speech and then the conclusion. So I could probably have added a little bit more or made a clearer break that this is a triangle, it does this, uh, try it for yourself, and here's the self the question, something like that. Thank you, Jay. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, I like this. I think you pretty much hit it on the nail. I'm not sure if I can add more to this, uh, that the, the, the transitions. I just think just, just uh, I, I think uh, the focus on this one was to show them the, I, I think you did everything well here. I just think just make sure that people understand that before you do it, like, you know, like tell them and just kind of elaborate more on before I show you this particular pose, let me just tell you what this pose can do for you. So they at least have some idea. And then you're going to demonstrate it and let them know that you know this is not a, this is going to be a quick demonstration. <laughs> it's not like something where I'm going to spend it. Because in real life, if you're doing it, it could take a little bit longer. You want to be very careful on how you do it because you, know, you don't want to hurt yourself. So I'm just going to demonstrate it quickly. When you do it, you should take much longer. Uh, and, and then after it's done, just say, so now you saw the pose, if there's anything that they should really know about, like this is how I, because remember, you are like an expert at this, right? But if somebody's doing it for the first time, what should they really watch out for? Because if they see you, they might think like, wow, this looks so, you, you're making it look so easy, right? So, so you, you want to be kind of careful there because sometimes what happens is that you've been doing this for many, many years and you want to let them know that I, I just want to show you that you don't have to do it. It may not be as smooth the, the way I'm showing you, but don't worry about that. And you you, you kind of, because a lot of times what happens is that people will give up if they feel like, my God, she did it so well, I just can't do it, or they could hurt themselves. So you just want to say, look, start out just simply, and then once you get more flexible, as you get more flexibility, but you got to start slowly because otherwise, you're just never going to get there. It could, and it has taken me many, many years to get to that point. I just think you need to emphasize that point because otherwise people will get disappointed pretty quickly and saying, wait a second, that Julie is like, you know, cause a lot of times you watch these videos where people do these exercises and they look so fit and you're like, wait a second, I don't look anything like that. <laughs> there is no way in hell I can even do that, right? And I don't watch it. I'm like, I just watch it more for entertainment <laughs> than I was ever going to do it. So anyway, uh, I, I think, uh, yeah. So just, uh, here's my thing. I, I think what you have to do is just try a lot of different things and see what really works uh, where you think that now I am really focusing on the audience. And I think I got my point across to the where that they could take it and start getting off their butt and doing it. Mm-hmm. Well, when you're going to do it, Jay? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I do do some of the that that the core, the other Sivasna that pose. I do Shavana. do that. Oh yeah, that's a really great pose. Yeah, so I have a, I have a, a, sleeping bag here that I use. So I brought it in in the office, and like when I, I usually do it uh, around the afternoon when my energy is kind of low. Uh, okay. so I will just uh, lie down, and if I listen to a podcast, uh, I'll just you know put this, and I'll just lie down and just do some stretching exercises. Uh, I also have like a ball. I have something where I'll just do some stretching exercises, and then yeah. I'll just uh, take a nap, and just uh, that that energizes me for the rest of the afternoon. And then it takes like it, it's amazing. Like I, I 
I think more companies should actually allow people to take naps uh, in the office because yeah. it, it rejuvenates you. This idea of like, oh, you show up for work and you just continue, continue, continue. Because your body is not something, it's going to do what it's going to do. You can't try to fight it. And a lot of times we fight it and we're not that productive. We start making yeah. mistakes. And if you just take a short nap for maybe 20 minutes or even 15 minutes, uh, you'll feel much better afterwards. At least I've started noticing it. But again, I don't report to anybody, so I can do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. It is going to do what it's going. The body is going to do what it's going to do. I think that's a great call. Um, yeah, a McDonald. You know, a McDonald uh, in the Hamburger University. They do have a quiet room. They have a meditation room where the room is dim, and you can just go and sit. Oh, a lot right. of people. Because, like, uh, this is what I do. You know that Sivasana that you demonstrated, right? Right. So I'll just lie down and I'll just just do like five deep breaths and I'll just like put my hand on my uh, diaphragm. Yeah, is that what it is? Your, your belly, yeah. Yeah, and I'll just like, I'll just take some deep breath, boop, like, you know, deep breath. I'm not going to show it right now, but I take deep breath and I'll, I usually say, okay, let me do five and then I'll just lie down and then I'll come back and do five more. And I'll just do that till and that just relaxes me yeah and sometimes great. i might just like take a take a because like i said uh, it's one of those things that you have to try because uh, like you said uh, some places they have a quiet room uh and in my case it's pretty quiet right because i'm the only one here and it does work because you don't realize that uh, there's so much noise that we deal with every day that yeah. sometimes you just need that quiet room and not talk to anybody and just kind of uh, reflect or contemplate or meditate. And it, 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 it really, it re and of course, with breathing, it makes a big difference. So I'm trying all these different hacks. And I think uh, little by little, I now know what's working and what's not working. And then the other thing that I do is I go for uh, a walk. And I do my three and a half mile walk. And now I put like some audio books on my uh, iPhone. Mm -hmm. And I will. I'm able to finish more books that way. And like right now, what I'm listening to is uh, from a public uh, speaking point of view. I downloaded this uh, live recording of Zig Ziglar. Oh sure, sure. I don't know if you've heard of Zig Ziglar. Sure. And I'm learning his style, like what makes him so good when he's giving a speech. What, like how he tells the story, how he uses his, his voice is so lively when he's talking. And I said, I need to understand that. I'm not specifically interested in the content, but how he takes one topic and he does so much with it that it's something we can all, so at some point I'm, I could give a talk on that. Like I said, I, I listened to that. It's a short one, it's not that long. I can finish half of it in one walk and tomorrow when I go for my walk, if, if it's not raining today, I'll go later today and I'll finish the second half. But what I notice is, is how, because I'm not seeing him, right? You, you can actually go on a YouTube and see him, but here I'm just listening to his voice because I'm more interested in how he's able to create that emotion with his voice. Mm -hmm. And it's a very powerful technique that he uses that we could all learn from. And also the simplicity in his, in his, and how he's like emphasizes certain things and he gets his point across. And the simplicity in his message, I think is very important that, uh, that uh, we could all learn from. And I try to, that's one of the things I, I'm doing lately. I've been listening to these motivational speakers, not to motivate me, but just to see that they, they get a lot of people, like, you know, I think, I don't know if you mentioned it, a lot of people mentioned it. Who's that guy? He's uh he does a show from Houston. He's a preacher. I forgot his name. Austin. Joel okay. Joel Joel Austin, right? Those are type of speakers I listen specifically because they have a huge audience, and I want to know what are they doing that I can pick up. So that's one of the things that uh, that yeah, uh, it, it's very clear. Your your um, actually, it's very interesting that you said that because. I don't know when it happened, but this week your voice and your emanation, your energy and emanation and your voice was much bigger to this week right. than even previous weeks. So something something clicked 
for you this week? I don't garden? know. Maybe it's because I've been listening to Zig Ziglar and I see what he's doing. It's the way he like really like, because remember when you. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm seeing more in yeah. you. So that's very good. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. We'll, we'll uh, stop here. Otherwise, we're, uh, but at one point I can talk more about that because I, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm going to write about that. I write in my book, but I don't go into a lot of detail. But I would like to record to have a discussion on, uh, around that. And you don't need to purchase it because a lot of this stuff is already on, on YouTube. You can watch. So maybe, I'll, maybe I'll select one. So let's say at this point take a pause and we'll move on to our favorite segment. The message hack, yeah. the one that you've been waiting for. So why don't yeah. you make your line and I'll I'll come back on and introduce the segment, okay? All right, welcome back to Speech Talk Live episode 42. My name is Jay Yoza, and we're moving on to our third segment. And uh, have my co-host, uh, Julie Wu Finkelstein. And in this segment, uh, we're going to uh, talk about what I call message hack. How do you hack a message? So what exactly is a message hack? H hack is something you, you kind of like try, iterate, incrementally, get make it better till it, and test it out till it starts working for you, right? So that's what a hack is, something you do it quickly rather than spend hours and hours and then find out it doesn't work. Hack is something you, you kind of, uh, you know, put together something quickly and then test it out. And if it doesn't work, try it again. You know, keep working on it till it starts. Uh, it's, you start seeing some results. So that's what a hack is. And in message, what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with a message that resonates with the audience. Now, wh why even bother with this? So you might be asking, like, you know, why do I need, like, why do I need a message hack? I'll tell them what I want to tell them. Well, there's a big reason, and the reason has to do with attention. People today are really attention, have attention deficit. We keep hearing that. Uh, try it yourself. You'll find out. Like if somebody's talking to you, how much time are you going to give them? You know, we all think like other people have all the time in the world to listen to us. But the question is, how much time are you giving when they're talking to you? Probably not much. Uh, maybe that's something you should uh, uh, note uh, on how much time they're giving you and how much time you're giving them. I notice it with my kids and all that, they don't really give me a lot of time, okay? So I know that there is a real problem with attention. And today, people have all kinds of uh, distractions, you know, like they got a smartphone, they need to check their Facebook, and there's a ding dong, all kinds of, you know, messages coming in. And people, you're fighting, uh, I, I, like, you know, people always say time is money. I'm not sure that's, I agree with that. Today, I think attention is money, because people got time, I have time. But attention, people just don't have. And if you can capture people's attention, you're going to succeed in whatever you do. So the purpose of a message hack is that if you want to say something, you better spend some time hacking that message and testing it and perfecting it or making it good enough so that it starts working for you. And the, it consists of five simple steps. And it, it, it's so simple that you start with start with one word. Then from one word, you move on to what I call tagline. This is something I borrowed from the film industry. They use the tagline. For every film, there's always a tagline. Or it could be a sound bite, whatever that works for you. And then from tagline, we move to a log line, which is like a one sentence. You should be able to tell people in one sentence whatever the message you want to uh, convey. If you can't do it in one sentence, then you got to keep working on it. And it's very important you do it in one sentence because somebody out there may not give you more than that much time. It could be like six, seven, eight seconds, okay? So one sentence is very, so keep the sentence simple. Don't use big words because they're not asking you to come and give a, a, you know, a seminar. This is something simple. They have to say, yeah, I get it. That's what they, that's what you're trying to get them to say. I get it. Tell me more. I get it. Tell me more. I understand it. I want to know more. So if you start using big words and that might make you feel good, make, make you feel smart, but it's not helping them, you're not getting the reaction you really want from them saying, oh, really? Okay, I want to know more. So you also have to kind of surprise them maybe so that they want to, you got to somehow surprise them with your one sentence. And we can talk more about that. Then after that, you're ready to give a 30 second pitch. And this is a pitch that should be tight that pretty much captures it in 30 seconds. Because again, people are not going to give you, 
So if you got to 30 seconds, means that you're taking away 30 seconds of their undivided attention. That's pretty remarkable if you can get that, where they are really going to pay attention to you for 30 seconds. You got 30 seconds, okay, of somebody's attention where you know they want to listen to what you have to say. So you've got to make it count. And then let's say after 30 seconds, they're really now interested, okay? Then you can go into your three minute speech. And that's it. That's as far as you're going to go. After three minutes, if you got to talk more, uh, at that point, you're getting into almost like giving a formal talk. It's Then you're getting into a point where somebody's going to invite you to say, you know, I like what you had to say. Why don't you come in here and give us a 15 to 20 minute or maybe a half hour, et cetera. At that point, you're ready to sell. At that point, you got to close the deal, whatever the deal you're trying to close, okay? If it's a, a book, then you better ask them to invite you to come and give a talk on a book. So in this today, what we're going to do, Julie and I are currently both writing a book. And we're going to use our book as using this message hack to convey the message of our book. So we ourselves are going to be example of how we're using this message hack. And we're doing it for the book that we're currently writing. So Julia, any comments on, I know you, you've you been using this message hack. Uh, what do you like about it and what works for you uh, when you're using this message hack? And obviously, we're going to see an example later uh, of uh, the message hack you've uh, put together for the for the book you're writing. Uh, you have a muted. Uh. Thanks, Jay. Um, yeah, I really like this message hack technique. Of course, uh, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook was known uh, famous for his uh, hackathons. So hack actually has two um, different definitions. One is that doing something illegal. The other one is just hack it, um, hack out something. So instead of, uh, you know, we're both from the system uh, areas, instead of going through like a long systems life cycle and then not knowing what it is, it's just, just uh, you know, prototype it. Just instead of trying to think it through, just do it. So it's almost like using the body of our, you know, instead of just like using our mind, we're using the body of our community and to um, launch this and just creating a shorter feedback loop. So I really like this uh, idea. <clears throat> I don't really stop. <clears throat> I, I start off with a couple of sentences. Uh, so I, I think in terms of doing a sentence, but I might come up with two or three sentences, and one of them will be more appealing or some combination. Out of that, I go back up to the tagline, and I'm still challenged with the one word, because I think uh, with the one word, right now I'm kind of thinking about it's what it's about, but really it's what will grab someone's attention. So the, that's why I'm playing with the one word, as you know. Um, so the purpose of the one word is not clear, but since you talk about attention so much, is how does that one word grab someone's attention rather than what is this article about? I think that's um, the uh, changing in the orientation. And then I go back and I do the uh, elevator speech, and then I take the elevator speech and make it into the um, three-minute speech. Uh, Excuse me. And it's very nice to work with you because we kind of bounce off each other, and I think our work gets um, much more powerful that way. Thanks. All right. Why don't you get a drink while <laughs> I, I, I talk? <clears throat> yeah. You, you're right. I think we're using the, the word hack here as a way of uh, it, you know, t testing something, you know, quickly and see whether it uh, resonates. So <clears throat> you can call it like hack it till they get it. You know, by that I mean is you got to keep hacking it till the people, the audience or whoever starts getting it, getting it quickly, I guess. that's what, So if they get it, that means your hack is working because attention is one of those things where they should get it quickly. Uh, it's either hit or miss. And uh, with, with hacking, that's what you're trying to get because, again, you're, you're trying to uh, 
uh, get there uh, with the limited amount of attention that you're going to get, you, you have to uh, make it uh, you know work. So <clears throat> to give you an example of uh, what a hack looks like, uh, we can go through an example that uh, we have worked on, both Julie and I. And uh, Julie, I, don't, I cannot see you, so I don't know what happened. Uh, if you're still there or we lost you, somehow you're. I'm, I'm seeing your name, but I don't see you. So, while while Julie's coming on, uh, I will start. I'll give you uh, my example <clears throat> of a hack that I've created. So I'm currently writing a book on public speaking. So this is the the I have to come up with a message. So if somebody's asking me, let's say if it's a, a for, informal event somewhere, where say, hey, what are you working on? I, I guess I'm working on my book. And they'll say, "What is your uh, book book about?" And I can say, uh, "My book is about uh, speaking." So that would be my one word, right? That's my one word. My book is about speaking. And again, it's one word because the one word should pretty much capture it, right? It should be so generic, general that it should capture it. You know, when people say, "Well, I'm having difficulty with one word." You got to try that because a lot of people do struggle with this one word. So then, uh, then the tagline would be like, so you know, what is the tagline? Is like the main thing they want you want them to remember. Okay. Now I'm not saying that it's going to go in the sequence, but this is the way you prepare for it. So the 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 the, the, the sound bite that I want them to kind of take away is this one: "You are how you speak." So as you can see, the word speaking is now still being used in the tagline. You are how you speak. So I've given them more information. So it's telling them the, so the book is about speaking and the thing that they can go and take it. The, the reason I'm using tagline is that's what I want them to tell somebody. So if they go and meet somebody and say, hey, do you know this guy named Jay Oza? He just wrote a book called You Are How You Speak. You know, It's pretty interesting. You may want to go talk to him. So that gives them something to take with them. It's a takeaway that they can go and and, and have a conversation. You know, people like to talk about people. And if you give them something to talk about, then they'll talk about you, right? And that's something we should always keep in mind that give people something to talk about. Make it so that they remember you. So I, that's the tagline. That's the purpose of a tagline. That and it can be quirky too. It can't be too serious. Tagline should be, hey, you know, he wrote a, this book, he's titled it, You Are How You Speak. You may want to find out what this is all about. And that's what you want to do. You want them to get more interested. It's almost like a kind of like you're marketing yourself. So then you move to the like one sentence. If somebody says, "Oh, what is the book about?" and I say, "Well, the book teaches people how they can become a great speaker and deliver a memorable experience to their audience." And that's where I'm at right now. And I'm saying that's the way. I, uh, this is my hack. I can keep on improving it. But in one sentence, I kind of capture what the book's about. It's teaching them how to become a great speaker so that they can deliver and they can also deliver a memorable experience, right? And that's what the book is trying to do. And then I uh, said, oh, that's interesting. So then, then I'm moving to the 30-second speech. At this point, if they're not interested, I'm done. I'm not going to give somebody a three-minute speech if they have no interest in my book, OK? So that's the whole point. So don't think like, OK, uh, uh, please stay here till I finish my all, you know, all, my 30-second pitch in a three minutes. It doesn't work like that. You have to improvise. You have to see where it's appropriate to use it. So you're prepared. You're armed. And now you're ready to use whatever bullets you need to, to get your point across, right? So the 30-second pitch would be, this is my 30-second pitch that I have written for this. Uh, so everyone would agree that you need public speaking skills to succeed both personally and professionally. So why many people still suck at public speaking? I think it has a lot to do with fear, time, method, and knowledge. Look, fear is constant, so you have to just overcome it with other three. You have to put in the time. There are no shortcuts when it comes to developing the skill. But time alone isn't going to do it. You need a method that will help you develop skills and perform those skills when the stakes are high. The book will teach and show you how anyone can master this skill and deliver a memorable experience every time. So that, in a way, is my 30-second pitch right now. And I keep on tweaking it. Remember, this is not perfect. This is something you have to keep on tweaking it based on, on, on the feedback you get on how the audience that you're talking to is reacting to it. But you have it. You sound like you got your blank together Okay, when you have these messages. Because a lot of times, it's not 
what you say, it's how you say it. If people think you sound like you got your blank together, you know, then they'll assume that you really do, that this guy, you know, he knows what he's talking about and you got to practice it. So a lot of it is that creating that perception. So let's say I'll just finish this up with my three minute speech now, okay? So if somebody's interested and I got their attention, so, you know, Jay, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to invite you. So tell me more about it. Like if I want to invite you to come and give us a talk, uh, what would you tell us? So this is what I would tell them. So at this point, I'm getting it. Remember, three-minute speech is something you're not going to get often, okay? That's something, this is where you're trying to close the deal where somebody's really interested. And this is what I tell them. See, so here's where I'm going to start now. When people ask me how they can become a great speaker, I say simple. I tell them to follow what I teach in my book. I teach them not only how to develop the skill, but also teach them hacks they can use to deliver a memorable experience to their audience. Public speaking skill is important for your success today because everything is getting more complex and people's attention span is getting shorter. So those who can quickly inform, connect, influence, and persuade will win. Public speaking skill is, uh, is important. Okay, what, what makes uh, uh, speaking so difficult is that most of us are good enough speakers, meaning that we can get along with people both socially and at work. So we don't really focus on improving this skill like we do with a, a hard skill like programming. But sooner or later, you will hit a wall like I did. When that happened, I found it difficult to learn this skill since I thought I was already a good speaker. Like many, I overrated myself with this skill. My book focuses on skills development and delivering a memorable experience and what you have to do to continue to improve as a speaker. The, the real talent of a, a great speaker is to make things easier so people are motivated to make a change. And that is what this book teaches you. The skill does take some time, so you have to start now so you can succeed both personally and professionally. If you follow what the book teaches, you too can speak with confidence, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, in a small group, or in front of a large audience. So that's my three-minute speech right now, and I kind of stumbled it because there was one sentence that I somehow have it uh, written three times for some reason. I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> that's why I got a little... Uh... So that gives you an idea that this is the exercise that I'm going through in creating my message. So again, it's one word, the log line, uh, the one word, the tagline, the log line, the 30 second pitch, and then the three minute, uh, 30 second pitch, and then the three minute speech. And that's all you need. If you do this much, believe me, this is not that easy, okay? This is hard, this takes a lot of work. But you should always do this first because if you can't get this right, nobody's ever gonna get, invite you to come and speak because they're gonna make decision based on this, not based on that, hey, I have a you know what this wonderful book. So this is a very important thing to do in whatever you're doing, whether it's for a job interview, whether you're trying to promote your book, whether you're trying to promote your uh, some sort of your skill that you have, some talent, whatever. You need this. This is where it, the rubber meets the road. This is where it all starts. This is really your first product. So at this point, I'll have uh, Julie. Uh, Julie, you want to? Uh, do yours and how you put together yeah. how you use the message hack to uh, create the message for the book that you're writing uh, yes I'll demonstrate my um, so the the one word I have is energy or stretch I cannot uh, I'm very challenged there the tagline is simple stretch sequence to energize our lives it's still not um, short enough for me. Um, the one sentence is these simple sequence poses clears the blockages so we can have unstoppable energy to evolve beyond where we are at. The 30 second speech I, I really need to add to it. Uh, these simple sequence poses help us to relax our body and mind, release blockages and frustrations and live fully energized and doing whatever we desire. Um, our body and mind are together. Together they can learn and evolve and go beyond where we are at. Three minute speech. 
<clears throat> I have worked um, I have worked with these simple stretches for years as part of my practice, Zen practice and body practice. These stretches clear my random thoughts so I can foc focus on my days and do my meditation. I find that I'm more energized and consistent when I do these stretches. I'm going to share these simple sequence um, powerful poses with you. The secret is in the sequence. Um, they help to release physical and psychological blockages so we can be naturally energized to achieve our goals and live up to our potential. Our natural heritage is to be consistently evolving and growing. I learned them from my Zen body therapist teacher, Ever Ogawa. Sometime during my practice, a few years after I started my practice, my traumatic patterns kicked in full force and I was not um, I was so depressed I could do nothing every day. I could just sit and and be still. These days, those days, the days that I could watch TV was a very good day. I couldn't even meditate, yet I was able to do these poses and stay, stay my mind. As I do so, my mind focused on the poses, my body calmed, and I slowly recovered. Many others have been helped. Let me tell you a little bit about the poses. The foundation of these stretches are that we can discover and evolve. So our heart bodies become resilient. Um, I'm going to skip that. There's a little bit more. I think I'm going to rewrite that. Tell them um, these stretches I shared with you have a long, has a long lineage. They are simple to do. Do them in order. Do them slowly. Do them with attention on how you feel. <clears throat> do them thinking what is possible or feels interesting is at the edge. Discover for yourself what is possible and try these simple sequence power forces. Okay, that that's roughly what it is. I, yeah. I think so, I already have to rewrite it. <laughs> yeah, right. But the whole point is that it's not supposed to be perfect, right? The point is that you started it and you're just going through the iteration and you're going to keep hacking it till people start getting it. You know, that's the whole point of this exercise, that this is not like one and done. This is just sort of like your living hack. <laughs> this right. is like your message. Your message is there. You're going to keep hacking it, hacking it, hacking it till it's... Uh, you know, starts because remember, until you start using it uh, without looking at the nodes, that's when you know that you're ready to test it out. Right. So, but you have to go through this exercise. So, uh, again, it can be frustrating. Uh, you just have to keep doing it, but don't like do it and discard it. This is something you got to keep on testing it. And sometimes you may have to get people to like uh, force them to listen. Hey, by the way, you know, do me a favor. I have this hack. What do you think? And always remember. Uh, and this is something that I mentioned to Julie, that when I listen to these uh, motivational speakers, uh, they're very, the reason why they are so successful is because they are very simple. Uh, they have to talk for a long time. And if they're not simple, and if they can't get you excited with their stories and, 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 and uh, do that, so you have to try to do the same thing because the burden is on you. The other person is not going to say, hey, I you know, you don't have to tell me a message. I think I figured it out. You know, it doesn't work like that. So you have to simplify, simplify, simplify till you have internalized it and you can give this message anytime. So this is something whenever you're in a car, just turn on your audio recorder and uh, practice your message that if you have to give a, a one sentence, definitely you want to practice the one sentence the 30 second pitch and the three minute speech that you can do anywhere, anytime, do it in the shower, you know, do it uh, when you're going for a walk, do it uh, when you're in car, by the way, is a very good way to do it. Don't listen to music or anything. Just turn on your tape recorder and just keep talking and you'll be amazed how much material you'll end up with. I mean, that's what I do. So unfortunately my rides don't tend to be that long. So I have to do it fast. So sometimes the three minute is a good way to, cause when I, I, I don't live that far away from the park. And by the time I get there, uh, I have to turn it off. Anyway, so so Julie, that was good. So any closing thoughts uh, on this? This is something, like if you have to tell people out there, 
I mean, you have friends out there who are writing a book. You have people who are in the entertainment business that uh, what can they use this for? Yes, I think that's a great idea. I think um, one, of the, one of the things that, um, that would be very useful is um, the professor uh, is looking into these um, the speeches is using this uh, as an introduction. You know, there, there's a lot of young people on the public speaking class, and they, they have a lot of concern about job interviews. So this message hack, as a template or as a model, as you would say it, uh, is a great way to help people become more effective at uh, interviewing. Um, I think that's right, but that's it, it, it could be used right. essentially by anybody uh, in anything. I think it's something yes. like if you want to yeah. go and uh, <clears throat> if you want to go and pitch a, a business idea. Like remember, the purpose of a message hack, and remember, you're going to have multiple of these. Okay, these are not just like this is what we used to call it the pocket full of maybe you can we can call it pocket full of messages, right? Because a message isn't you may have one consistent message on who you are. But if you're trying to appeal to young people, to different people, you may need a, to tweak your message for different uh, audience in different situations. So this is not like, first you need that one universal message. Like in this case, we just used a book as an example, but there might be another message for something else. And this is the way to at least, so that informally, like for example, if I read a book, I'll create a message for that book, right? So like, for example, this show we're doing, Speech Talk Live, I have to create a message for this show. If somebody asks me, hey, uh, you do this show called Speech Talk Live, what is it about? Like, uh, tell me more about it. I need to have a message, like a, like a talking point, right? So that I can have an informal conversation. So this is not something you just do it for some big thing. It could be done for something as small as you can go on a, you could be going on a vacation, or you're, let's say you went on a vacation, or you went to a concert. Use that and create a message for that. What did you get out of that? So anyway, Julie, thanks a lot. Thank and let, let me any closing thoughts for the show before I close this uh, close the, the the show out. Uh, no, I think it was very useful and very uh, instruct instructive. So uh, great job, thanks, Jay. Okay, Julie, thanks a lot. So uh, thank you all for watching. And as you saw that uh, we did our three minute uh, speech segment. And then uh, we went into uh, this particular discussion around taking a look at, we didn't really review the speech, but we used Amy Curry's famous uh, TED talk and kind of showed you that this is a good model to use for, for anything that you're doing. And we kind of even discussed it when, when, we, dis when we talked about uh, Julie's uh, uh, recording of her triangle pose that that model could be used for that too. And uh, I want to thank Julie for recording, uh, sending us that video to use and having a discussion around how to uh, demonstrate something in a video. And then, and so that's another way of uh, using the, the video to communicate, to show something that you're doing. In this case, Julie's uh, using it to uh, show people how to do these stretching uh, exercises uh, to energize themselves. And in the last segment uh, we just concluded, we talked about uh, how to create a message. And this could be for small thing or could be for big thing, but the message, the idea remains the same. So uh, let me conclude by saying that you are how you speak and that part you control. Look at us, we're getting on this show, we're talking, we're speaking, and uh, we are trying to get better. And that's exactly what you have to do because this is a skill that uh, most of the time we fail at it unless you make a deliberate effort to keep on improving it. So if you have any questions, suggestions, or comments on how we can help you, just uh, let us know. And thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week uh, with episode number 43. So thank you. All right. So what do we need to talk about for the miscellaneous part? OK. Um so um, I don't know if you want to, but I wrote some notes. When oh, yeah, go ahead. You have some comments on the speeches. So go ahead. So let me hear it now. Yeah, it's just, you know, I always try to find something good. I want to uh, help you continue in, uh, in, in large, and then something you can work on. Um, how do you find it now? Give me one second. OK. Um, <clears throat> 
in the segment one, I thought you did a really good job of explaining the research section. Um, you repeated the idea in different words. You said how nonverbal influences you and how the body affects the brain. So I thought that was a um, very nice way of, um, you know, um, staying on a point to make it important and not make it boring. Um, the, the suggestion I have to improve the speech is just that when you talk about Amy's speech, you didn't really say what kind of speech it is when you first open it or where you can get it. So if you said something like Amy Cuddy uh, was a famous speaker, um, she was number two in the TED speech, and I've included the, in this segment, you can find it there. That will help. And then one more good point is I, I think you use anaphora. You say you got to do this, you got to do that, and that was a nice way of uh, repetition. <clears throat> That's it. And, and, and okay, and what about the, you had a comment I saw that uh, I didn't define what a message hack was, Is that what, was that the thing? Yeah, you didn't define, no, I, I got that in the later, but I will bring it up higher. You know, I, as I listen later, I have it. I think the, um, what I really like about the message hack is the idea, and you're really becoming more comfortable with the idea. And then um, the the suggestion for improvement is you uh, in the speech, you talk about how important attention is, and then you say attention is money, time is not money, attention is money. But the example you use, the Donald Trump, is about getting attention. It's not about the point why time is money. So that kind of got jumbled up. So okay. if, if, you, if you eliminate the point, time is money, attention is, you know, attention is money, time is not money, and replace that sentence with, and here's an example of how you can get attention, Donald Trump, then there's more coherence. Okay, the transition wasn't good there, okay. Well, the transition, you took us to a different point, but you never explained that point, so yeah. Right, right, right. I have to watch it again, because I thought what I was trying to say there was uh, that if, here's an example of how he has been so successful that it's not necessarily the money that he's spending, it's the attention that he's been able to get. Anyway, that, oh, you're yeah. right. That's why, that's, that, that's because he hasn't spent a lot of money. He's just been successful in getting people's attention. Free attention. I, I, I would just get rid of this point. Attention is money. Is money. Time is not money, because it's um, it's superfluous to your. Right, right. But the re the, okay. The reason uh, uh, I, I mean I don't want to defend this though. The reason I say that is sometimes you have to be a little provocative because it, it, you have to also kind of surprise the people because if you if you too predictable then you sound like, oh, this guy's basically giving me the same thing that I've heard before. Now, you do need to do that. Sometimes you, the 90% of the stuff you do should be the thing that audience already knows. But nobody's ever said that, that today, attention is really money. And then I gave an example of uh, <laughs> Donald Trump. So, I mean, the reason I did, that was like sort of my taking a little risk there. And the reason I did that is because at every speech, I want to surprise somebody. <clears throat> where the reaction that you got is exactly the kind of reaction I wanted. That, oh, wait a second. Hmm, I haven't heard it that way, so I might have to think about this. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, I like the idea of surprise. You might just want to see if. Um, Make it if more you, clear. If you, yeah, if you're back at that point, because okay. uh, that was my whole idea. Right, because I think you, you did that in one of your speeches where you started using the word sexy, which was kind of came out of nowhere, but then it, 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 it suddenly draws you in. It's like, whoa, where did that come from? And right. sometimes you have to make your speech uh, a little unpredictable. Otherwise, if it's too predictable, I can already see what this is. Because in a way, you're kind of following the predictable thing. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them, right? But in between doesn't mean you can't surprise them with something. Yeah, I'm just saying, OK, your point is it's good to surprise them, and I totally agree. 
I was I was trying to look at the coherence. Oh, okay, the, yeah, yeah. The, the coherence point. So right, right. That's right. all. I have to look at that. Yeah, but I th I get your point. The clarity is always uh, something we all have to work on. Okay. Okay. The second point I think is um, when you talked about the way you develop the methodology, I thought it was too self-deprecating. What you said was, it's nothing original. I combined it from a bunch of sources, including marketing and Abe Lakin. Well, I, uh, I understand there's humility and stuff, <clears throat> but in fact, that's very original. Uh, it, it's an extensive research. So um, I would invite you to give yourself more credit and say, I have a very deep interest in this area and over the decades I've re I've studied and read and then all these different, so different sources is giving me this new perspective. I've synthesized right. a vast amount of different sources into this simple, easy perspective, right? Because that's what you did. Right, right. That's a good point. By the way, this is a good <clears throat> book. You may want to someday check it check it out. Can you see yeah, it? Yeah, you ex you um you introduced that. Actually, I had read that ten years ago or whenever it first came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been out. It's been out. Uh, let's see. It's been out in two thousand and. Uh, it's a great book, by the way. I even bought the book. But I think I gave it away. Two thousand and three. Oh, I never give books away. <laughs> well, you know, I gave away sixty percent of my books, and much to my sadness some of it are out of print so I can't there, even get them there's again. one thing I never do is I never let anybody borrow my books I'm just very hard on that because I never get it back right and it just it just takes me off that people don't care about the books the way I do so yeah. when somebody comes to my so I actually don't even allow them to come into my office because as soon as they see the book they'll pick one up and say hey can I bring this and I just like I'm like uh, 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 I, I, I don't want to, <laughs> you know I know that I'm not going to get that back and believe it or not I've done that so many times and I ended up buying it again because they, they never yeah. gave it back to me right I had a relative who came and took some three four books from my uh, room and I can't go to the guy go to her and say give me my books back it looks kind <laughs> of bad so I had to go and repurchase all those books again from the the, the marketplace okay so, so course, you know overall I think of course I think the message hack is a great uh, idea and I I think your your body line your energy was much more that's the one I saw that there was a lot more energy and um, actually at one point I think you move forward I thought that was really, really good. I don't know in which, oh, in the Amy Cuddy one, at seven minutes, it's the first time I saw you actually physically took a step. Oh, you like that? It was very clarifying. It really showed the pivot. Oh, okay. And it gave the, it gave the audience a time to let the information settle as you move. So that was very good. I have to watch it again. Okay. Yeah, that's why I say it's at, it's at about seven minutes. Seven minutes? Okay. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so your book is coming along well? Yeah, I, I sent it to this uh, woman. I just asked her to read a thousand words. Mm. And actually, I got all the feedback I want, what I, I needed. She said the tone was good. Um, she said, I come across as uh, compassionate knowledgeable, and knowledgeable. And uh, she said the language was clear, she understood it, and she liked the organization. So basically, for 15 bucks, <laughs> I got the feedback I was looking good, for. Good. That's sometimes and, the best way to do it. Yeah, and then she gave me, uh, she also, I also asked her to edit some sentences, and her edits are well within my range of what I'm capable of doing. I just didn't do it yet. So I think I am going to finish this book and then I will rewrite the bigger book. You know. Yeah, I would just say, just like you were telling me, uh, uh, don't worry about the like how big and because you can determine whether you want to, you can even make it free if you want, right? Or you can charge like the minimum, like you can, the best price is to charge two ninety nine, 
and right. then have a companion course that's a video that you could create that right now you don't need to create a course right now what you can do is just create the youtube videos as a kind of a companion course that they can follow so you can link right. it to your videos and try different things so i would not spend too much money or too much time if you got the main idea just make it 12 poses and just just ship it at some point you just have to ship it and then yeah. once you ship it but, but don't forget this it, is only three months i've only worked on it for no 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 months. but i think at this point you're getting you and i are both kind of getting stuck and I, i'm in the mode right now that i have to ship it because until right. you ship it you're not an author i'm not stuck at all because um I I wanted to take a break to get feedback, so I got some feedback from Patty, and I'm not sure I agree with her suggestions because when she said the expanded table of contents was very confusing for her, and I think that's true for her because she's writing a fiction, you know, she's writing a novel, she so she won't want to give away. But maybe that's true. Maybe I'll just pull it out and put it into the introduction. Oh, no, no, I, I don't so. think t table of contents. I don't think it's a is 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 a comment. I mean, table of contents is just there because you gave me that comment, and I agreed with you that you need to be able to show people so that they can navigate. Because nobody reads the book. A fiction, you're right. It's you have to read it from start to finish. You don't jump over. Okay, places. so you think the TO's table of content is okay the way it yeah, is? Yeah, 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 yeah. For nonfiction, table of contents is very important, not for fiction. No, I mean the expansion. With yeah, the yeah, yeah, sentences. yeah, right, right, okay. right. Because it, 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 sometimes that's what I want to read because that will tell me what the book is about. And then I'll right. select which section do I want to jump to rather than because, okay. like, like if you notice, if you read. Jane Austen's book. It's just chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter right, five. Like, right, right. Maybe one word, right? Yeah, that's it. No, that's it. There's no real like, explanation of what that chapter is about. It's just that's how they wrote in those days. And you just have to read from start to finish. Uh, and, and that's it. Whereas a nonfiction, that's that's not the way it should be. Okay. Nonfiction okay. content, table of contents, very important. Okay, great. Thanks. So, um, I don't know if you're interested. I thought it might be interesting to, to have a dialogue on money and identity and what's important in one's life. Right, right, right. So um, there's another one. You said the the nature of collaboration. I think the buddy part is very important. I think that could be a. Why don't you take a shot at that one? Because you do a lot of buddying with people. So why don't you take that one? <laughs> I don't one. know what you, what you mean by uh, take that one. You mean just Get people's feedback, or no, 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 no. Record a speech on the importance of having a buddy, whether you're writing a book. Oh, the buddy thing. Okay. Buddy, the, the buddy approach. The buddy approach. So why don't you come up with a name for that? And record okay. a video. Yeah, take a pause. I think you already have recorded a lot of the poses. So next week, instead of a pose, maybe you can also include a, a discussion topic on. Uh, so okay, so since this is for this uh, speech talk live. Use it in the context of becoming a good speaker on on having a buddy. Why it's so important that without a buddy, it's very hard to improve on your own. That you can find a good buddy. First of all, what are the things you should be looking for in, in a buddy, and then what are you expecting from a buddy? It's sort of like a one on a a, a, a one on one a two man mastermind group like that, right? where you don't need a lot of people, but you need that one person that you can count on. So come up with some ideas around uh, the buddy approach in developing a particular skill, whether it's a speaking skill, whether it's a book or whatever. I don't really want to do that right now. I'm really working on identity because I'm, um, I'm trying to get a freelance article together for identity. So I don't want to take on um, a new topic. So I... Um, if All right, I'll, I'll take I'll take that then. I'll take that. Okay. If you don't want to, if you don't want to uh, talk about money uh, and identity, I'll just uh, I'll take I think, another. I think you did the identity. What exactly? What part of identity you want to cover this time? I'm going to have to think. I'm thinking about maybe. Uh, I don't know. Maybe relating that once you have your identity together. Um, talk about where money sits in the identity. 
and I think that you got really excited talking about that. And oh yeah, yeah. The elephant in the room. Right, right. Because at the end, uh, yeah, yeah. So just to just focus on instead of tr trying to boil the ocean with the one speech, just say, listen, I want to talk about identity. There are three parts that I want to focus on, but in this speech, I'm going to focus on the money part because that's the one that a lot of people don't really. You know, it's important, but they don't understand what that really means. Like, what is it? Everybody wants more, more, more money. But sometimes you have to ask yourself, what does more really mean? For what? Right? Like, like in a way, you're creating more insecurity for yourself. Right? And that's the thing. Like, a lot of people out there are going to keep on having more and more money. And what are they missing by trying to... Like, what is the minimum you need? What are the things you need to take care of? Well, then see, ask, I, don't, I don't want to take it that way either. I'm sorry. That's also your perspective. My, my perspective is people want money and they want... They want uh, to make money, but they're afraid to say that. So okay, take you whatever angle you have, and I can always comment on it, right? Right, right. Uh, I mean, it's it's your speech. You can put it. You can have any point of view you want. It just means that then I'll just comment on it. Yeah, uh, you can comment on whatever you want. But my my whole point is this: since I've worked with about many people, a lot of people, maybe it's only women, but maybe men too, maybe women more is they, they're very unrealistic about money and their identity. Um, so people will say, like you're saying people want to chase after money. My point is people want to make a lot of money, but they are afraid to say that. And then their identity gets confused. Let me, let me, let me put some points together. Maybe what we can do is have a dialogue. Cause yeah. I'm, Maybe instead of um, me crafting a speech, I could craft a speech and then we can open up, instead of like talking about the speech, we can just have a dialogue. That would be fun. Right, 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 right. right. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, I, 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 I think... Tell me some of your key points. Your point is people chase money. No, 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 I, I don't know what my point is. What I'm saying is what I've noticed is, and something that I think we've all kind of fallen into trap of it, that most people do not think of money like what exactly money when they think of money is always one thing you got to have more and more and more and i'm saying that by it's like this you know if you want this then something else has there's got to be a trade off somewhere right so everybody wants everything and that's just not possible and a lot of times the part I that like every, the idea of a trade off yeah that, that, like what are the three things you have to balance and that's the thing that sometimes people are just chasing money and they want to be happy right well, you can't have everything. And the, the thing every time everybody tries to tell you is like, yeah, you can have everything. And that's just unrealistic, right? You can't have everything. You have to ask yourself that if you want to make a lot of money, you have to give up a lot of things too. And then right. don't say that, oh, well, uh, my family is, you know, I don't even know them now. They don't love me. Well, that's an investment you can't suddenly get with money. Again, that's a deep topic, but a lot of things. I've been thinking about this. That's why. That's why. Well, when you I, I I think we should have a dialogue. Right, because when you mentioned money, it suddenly triggered. I said, wait a second, that's a big topic because a lot of people out there always think about money, and it's not. They never ask themselves what is the right amount. Have they even given thought to it? Because when you mention money, the knee jerk reaction is like, hey, I got to make more money. Hey, I got to get more bigger raise. But then ask yourself that if you got a good job that's giving you a lot of things, maybe the big raise is not really what you want. But everybody's conditioned into thinking the way because money is measurable. These other things are not measurable. I can't measure your happiness, but I can measure your bank account. Well, okay, so we have two points. Let me let me play with that and see. Yeah, I'll send you uh, the recording of this because there's a lot of stuff that you know we're talking here, and you'll yeah, get an idea of which let, one. Let me let me what's, start. What's your uh, angle? That's the thing you have to work on. What is the angle that you're taking regarding money? The angle I want to take is identity and money. How money and identity, the relationship between money and identity. Like how money is defining your identity? Yeah, that's how some people think they have to be a lot, have a lot of money to be successful. Or some people are ashamed to talk about money because they think there's something shameful about it. And, um, I'm not clear. Let yeah, me... I, I think you want to be careful there because if if, if somebody is just 
thinking that unless they make have money for you to understand that money is important so you don't want to say it's not important because everything out there people out there are not just going to give you things you need money the question is at what point does it start affecting you in, in a negative way that's i think is Let, what i okay that's what you want to talk about no no no, no. i mean that's one angle i'm not yeah. saying that's let me ask you the question can you talk about money and someone's identity yeah, because people are defined by their money. So that's money is defining their identity. They're known for their money. And is that the identity do they really want? Do they okay. want to be, do they want to be defined by do they want their identity? Like, like, do I want to know? Like, I don't even know what you're worth. OK, I know you as a nice person, somebody that I get along with, somebody who's very helpful and all that. That's right. my that's the identity that I have of you. OK, right. But if let's say you are like a wealthy person, then that's the part that's dominating me like i'm really having a relationship with you not because of all these other things that i just mentioned but just because of that hey julie wu finkelstein is this really wealthy person and i may be able to get some help from her somewhere right, right. so the question is when you meet somebody how do you want them to know it as the person that you are or the person based on how rich you are the money that's defining your identity how do you want to project that to the other person i don't know that's yeah i think that's a, i think i think that's where you and i have a common interest what you just said so let let me um let me maybe not this week because this might take me at some time but i have more stress i think you should just anyway. i think okay okay for, for, wait wait let me just stop you right here i think you should hack a speech don't if you don't want to use it that's fine but i think you should i'll send you the recording of this and just hack something all right okay so don't worry about if it's perfect just hack whatever comes to your mind just write down some few points and just bring it up and just say jay i don't want to use this but this is my hack and then we can develop it further like that this that's is part of this is part of experimentation because I don't want you to work on trying to build up a perfect speech all the time. So just hack it. Oh, you know? believe me, it's not even perfect. I just want to have some coherence. No, know? no, no. But but again, you, so. you 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 can do your best. At the end, it's how I react to it, how other people react to it, right? right? All right. So okay. I think thanks a lot. That was helpful. So I'll send you the link of this uh, uh, this miscellaneous talk, and you can get some ideas and see if you can hack a, a speech on money together regarding okay. identity. All right. I'll do that. All right, Julie, thanks a lot. As Thank usual, you. Uh, you did a great job. So did and, you. Uh, so did uh, you. Th <laughs> thanks for all your effort. And uh, if any question, I'll just put it in the document, OK? Sounds good. And enjoy, thanks. enjoy your weekend, and I'll talk to you later. OK, you too. Thanks, okay, Julie. Bye. bye.